think this is very uh, mundane, but it might be helpful to some of you. One of the things I was doing on our rental property, which is down in Highland Park, is we had a big tree that we had to take down, and I've got lots of firewood that I can't carry home with me. Uh, so if you need firewood, talk to me, I'll give you the address. And we have a, a property manager, and I said, I'm going to offer this to anybody who wants it. So if people are coming and taking wood, don't feel like they are feeling <laughs> <laughs> and so if you if you want some firewood, some of it needs to be lit, others is ready to burn. But if you burn wood, let me know. I'll be glad to give you the address and we can we'll get some wood. With that, it's time to get started with our class. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that we are able to look into the lives of people in scripture. And this month, look into the conversations between you and one of the few people in Scripture that is actually designated as your friend. I know that you are friends with many people and with all of us, but it's interesting that there are a handful of people who are specifically called the friend of God. May we not be intimidated, but instead may we learn something about how our own friendship with you can be made better because of studying these conversations between you and Moses on the September. Well, many of you were here last week, and we looked at one conversation between God and Moses, and that was at the burning bush. Today, we are looking at another very familiar story, and that is Mount Sinai. And there's quite a conversation. There's actually three conversations kind of in a row between God and Moses there. Next week, John Cosgrove will be leading us into conversations where Moses is just railing at God and just spewing out all kinds of anger. That would be a good conversation to look at. And then the last week of the month, we will be looking at the final conversation between God and Moses. So we're not really studying the life of Moses. We are looking at four different conversations and dropping into them. And especially last week and this week, we're looking at very familiar ones. Now, next week may not be as familiar to you, but very familiar stories. And we're just focusing on the conversation. I realize there's many other things that we could look at. And it would be interesting but distracting to our main purpose to go down all the other trails we could go down. Instead, we want to say, what is there in this conversation that helps us understand better how we can connect with God, and how our own friendship with God can grow? Let me tell you what we're going to be doing today. Today is the story, really, of the events right after Mount Sinai. And some of you, if you're familiar with this story, know it's the golden calf. The golden calf, and we won't talk a lot about that. I'll just give you enough if you're not familiar with it, because I realize we might have some people who are not real familiar with it. I'll give you enough so that you can make sense of the conversation, but that's not the story we're studying, but that is the context. And then there's three conversations that take place over the next week or so, but it's kind of one long conversation. And in these conversations between God and Moses, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to try to summarize. We're going to do this as a group. It'll be a little bit, a little bit challenging, but we're going to summarize. What does God say? What's kind of the essence of God's part of the conversation? What does Moses say? And that'll help us. Okay, now we've got a, we've got a framework. Then, what do you admire about God? What do you admire about Moses in this conversation? And then we're going to be looking, okay, what, una what unanswered questions do you have? Because there's all kinds of things that will come up. I promise you, we will not answer all these questions. We may not answer any of them. But I at least want you to vocalize them. Because sometimes when we study scripture, we are afraid that questions mean that there's something wrong with us. Or that maybe we don't have enough faith or something like that. And I want to acknowledge those questions and note them. Because it's something you can come back to. But in this class, obviously, we're not going to have time to do that. But let's note the questions. And then here's really the punchline of what we're getting. We're working our way through. We've got to do these observations to make sure we're really seeing the story and the conversation. 
what does this tell us about the friendship between like I mentioned in my prayer, there are only a handful of people. Abraham is one of them. Moses is one. No, there are one or two others who are specifically called the friend of God. That's not to say that we aren't all friends of God. We can't all be. But there seems to be something there of a closeness that they get designated that way. And that's just something then that we should note if we're looking at these conversations between God and Moses. What does this say about that friendship? So that's what we're going to be doing. And by the time that we've done, and all of you guys know how this goes. When, we do, when I do something like this in the board, we spend a lot of time here. And a little bit of time here. And the last three minutes we say, oh, we haven't done this. So let's see what we can do to kind of even it out and move our way across. Because I want us to see all three of these conversations. And then where I want us to close is to say, okay, what do we see here, here, and here about our own friendship with God? How can this, how can these three conversations help us in understanding what a friendship with God looks like? What is, how can I deepen in that? So I, I have a feeling that all of us in this room have some interest, maybe even if it's a little interest, in having a deeper friendship with God. That's that's my assumption. Okay. Let's open our Bibles to Exodus chapter 32. All of these are Exodus, by the way. Exodus 32. And for those of you that are not real familiar, the story of the Ten Commandments is Moses going up to Mount Sinai, receiving the tablets from God, Coming back down with them when he sees the people at the um, foot of the mountain dancing around the golden calf, he throws the tablets down, they shatter, and then God says, Well, let's do this again. And he goes back up and God writes them again. So that's kind of the, the rough outline of what's happening here. But what you may not realize, you may have forgotten, is that when Moses goes up to get the, the Ten Commandments, he's gone for six weeks. He's gone for six weeks. He's gone 40 days. And during that time, the people come to Aaron, who is kind of second in command, and they say, Aaron, you don't know what happened to this guy. They have been very, very dependent upon Moses, and now he's gone for six weeks, and they say, you know, for all we know, he could be dead up there on the mountain. And so we need something to hang on to. Will you make us a golden calf? <clears throat> a golden calf was a, a familiar idol from Egypt. They wanted something familiar. It's an interesting story, and it's one that we could look at more, but that's what happens. Now, Aaron becomes quite complicit in this, and, and Moses gets a little bit ticked off with him when he comes back and finds out his part of it. So that's an all an interesting part of the story. We're not going to be looking at that. Instead, we're dropping into the conversations three of them, that take place between God and Moses around this situation. But that's that's the story, that's the context. So here in chapter 32 and verse 7, this is where God gives Moses a heads up. Moses actually knows what he is going to find in the foot of the mountain before it gets there. And it's from this conversation. Chapter 32, verse 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave, leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them, that I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord, his God. Oh Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out? to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth. 
Turn from your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. I will give your descendants all this land. Promise them to be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he threatened. An interesting conversation. Especially if last week's conversation is ringing in your ears. When Moses is at the burning bush. And God says, I'm going to do this. Come along with me. And Moses, no. Nope. God says, well, here's, a, here's something I'll do to help you. No, nope, not interested. You remember, it goes back and forth. And finally, Moses says, okay, I'll do it. So that was the last conversation ringing in our ears, which was several months ago. But we're not that far. We're just a few months later. Now this conversation. What do you make of it? So let me hear from you. How would you summarize, and look at the text, how would you summarize in a, in a phrase or two, what's God's part of this conversation? I found it kind of interesting that God says to Moses, your people. Yeah, you got it. And, and yeah. Moses says to God, your people. <laughs> Have parents ever done that? This is your child? <laughs> yeah, okay. No, it's your child, yeah. Um, so that was an interesting part. What else? What else did you see, and how would you summarize what God says here? God is testing Moses. Is God testing Moses? What do the rest of you think? Yeah, there seems to be maybe some of that going on. What else? What do you think? What do you see? Yes, please. Maybe God is not so much testing Moses as allowing him to see how much he's grown Ooh. in his love for the people. Oh, Becky. That was worth the price of admission. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, could I give an example of what Becky just said? From the life of Jesus. Do you remember in the last year of Jesus' life, when we studied Jesus' life, when he feeds the 5,000, and then instead of going south to Jerusalem for Passover, he goes north and leaves the country. And there he meets a Syrophoenician woman whose daughter is very, very sick. And she comes pleading with Jesus to heal her daughter. He's a heathen. He's a Gentile. You remember how Jesus treats her? It's indifference. And then he calls her a dog. He says, it's not right to take the, the food from the children and throw it to the dogs. And what did she say? He says, well, even little dogs get some scraps from the table. And Jesus can't stand it any longer. And he says, I love your faith. <laughs> yes, of course I'll heal your daughter. But what's he doing all this time, Becky? He's allowing herself and others to, to affirm her her faith in him and her love for him. Yeah, and he's letting the disciples see what jerks they are. Because yeah. <laughs> he did the same thing. Yeah. Because the disciples are saying, it's about time Jesus called a Gentile a dog. And, and here's my picture of this. I've told you this when we've taught this lesson before. Is that if, if you look at the setup, she comes and falls at Jesus' feet. That means that Jesus and her are close. Their faces are close. The disciples are most likely behind Jesus. So that means they can't see his face. I think he winked at her. <laughs> I really do. I think he winked at her as he was talking. So she knew that there was something else going on. She couldn't quite get it all. But she knew there was something else going on. And so she says... No, but dogs get some of the scraps from the table. And then Jesus bursts into a big smile and says, yeah, that's it. And the disciples are meanwhile back there. You know, they're all ready to, to say, Jesus is finally doing what we think he should be doing. And then Jesus just completely blows them away. And they realize what Jesus is doing. So I think something similar is going on here, Becky. Yeah. Somebody else. Please, right. It doesn't seem like Moses is very angry at the people. Yeah, it doesn't. God is pretty angry, and he's not. What do you make of that? <laughs> yeah. No, hang on, I'll take your hands in just a second. Next week, Moses is so mad. You've seen these emojis with smoke coming out the ears and, you know, top of the head. 
the atomic bomb coming out. That's Moses next week. Yes, hand moves in here. Well, God can see what the people are doing. Most Moses hasn't seen it yet. He doesn't really. That that's a good point. Is God saying they're not doing right? Yeah, that's a good point. Go yeah, good point. Go on. I think sometimes when we're aware of our own sinfulness and we see other people, there's mercy. Ah. You know, and Moses is has through his forty years has just become such a humble person and realizes. Yeah, he is good done, point. Uh, in his own arrogance. Yeah. And yeah. Now, of course, we're at the early part of this. We're not we're not at the end of the 40 years, but he is already starting to mellow. Certainly from the burning bush. Becky, you got another I comment. Lost it. Oh, sorry. It's okay. okay. Did I miss any other hands? <laughs> yeah, right. I see Moses. And I think what God was doing is what you said a minute ago, your people. He killed an Egyptian when he was younger because of getting to identify with his people. Yeah. And uh, the burning bush experience, all of these things had to be overwhelming, simple human being experience. Hey, there's a dynamic process going on here. Yes, sir. Rob. I think there's something even more profound. Please. I think this is a demonstration of a very close friendship. Yes, you're jumping there's down. A, there's a strong bond there. It is. Do you, do you want to give any more on that, or you don't? You don't argue and you don't fight with somebody you don't care about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Rob and I were talking about this the other day, actually. And somebody you don't care about, you just treat with indifference. But somebody you care about, you engage with. Okay, Becky, and then Beth an example of God having emotions and what we would tend to consider negative and yes. sinful emotions. Yes. But it's not, but he didn't act on those emotions. He did something different. So the emotions we, I mean, you know, it's, oh, you, you shouldn't be angry. That's wrong to be angry. Emotion is not the problem. What you do with it. And God demonstrates that through this conversation. Wow. Good comment. Thank you, Beth. Suspense. Yes. This is a final test. <laughs> That's what I was. Did you all hear, Beth? No. They just spent six weeks in close contact with each other. Don't forget that context. And this conversation comes at the close of that six weeks. What are they going to talk about six weeks? Yeah. You just <laughs> think through that. It's like, hey, how about Joe? How about Phil? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Never been on a long car ride with the same people. And pretty soon you run out of stuff to talk about. <laughs> um, and and yeah, what was it like for six weeks? Okay, we've said a lot of things here. Let's see if we can summarize. If you were to put in a phrase here, what's God's part of this conversation? Look at the text. What's God's part? Give me a summary. <clears throat> so upset. I'm sorry. Upset. Upset. Okay. I'll destroy these people and start over with you. Okay, good. Upset. Destroy. Restart. With Moses. Now, by the way, we, we didn't comment on that at all. How would that? Oh, just a second. Let me ask the question and then you can answer it. Um, <laughs> how would that sit with you? God said, I am done with these people. Let's let you and I start something together. You know, when I think about something like that, you know, God knows what's going to happen, you yeah. know? And God doesn't lie, you know? But I think he can bait people. <laughs> you know? I'm going to put that word in here. God is baiting. And again, I would go back to my illustration of Jesus with the Syrophoenician woman. I think Jesus was definitely baiting the 12. I think he was. And I think he draws us in so that we then are, oh, huh, red handed. Yes, Joe. 
could have thought of God letting off steam, but in this passage, he didn't say he's just letting out steam. <laughs> okay, let me put that here. God is letting off steam. Okay, we're going to have to go on to Moses. How would you summarize Moses here? You summarize Moses' part of the conversation, right? One more statement on the first one. I think he was teaching Moses because he came from being a Pharaoh's uh, high family, and then he was in charge of uh, all of his father-in-law's chief and everything. Yep. Yet now he had to be able to work on behalf of all of these people. Okay. So. Okay. Um, with this in humility. Go on to Moses. Can you summarize Moses? Ellie. For being such a humble man, he's pretty cocky. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, he's talking to God. He's talking to God. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's bold. <laughs> it shows how much he's grown. He's invested in these people. He didn't want to. He's invested, and now he's protecting them. He just bought them. Um, and again, I will name no names. I think of somebody in our family who was determined that we're not going to have kids. Best parent around. Excellent parents. Why would I want a bunch of little brats running around? Marvelous parents. And there seems to be something like that going on. Okay, so... This is Douglas. Oh, this is this is Marlene. May I say something? Please do. I think uh, Moses is terrified. I think he's taking on the responsibility for all the people that he brought out of Egypt, and he doesn't want that. Ooh. So. He says, don't, don't put this on me and oh, don't leave and, me alone. And pardon me, but I think you're actually jumping ahead a little bit to next week and a conversation next week. <laughs> but I think there's something to that. I think there could be. Because we see this almost on and off love-hate relationship between Moses and the people for the next 40 years. Which again, is not all that different than parenting. <laughs> to me, this demonstrates Moses' selflessness to a point. Yeah. As a, a selfish person would have said, you know, I am pretty good, aren't yeah, I? Let's go, let's go for option B. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we're seeing his selflessness. Something that nobody's mentioned. And it's actually quite a bit of the conversation. Look at Moses' conversation. Moses part of the conversation again. What does he use? as a rationale to try to convince God. Very specific, a line of thought he uses. Ruin your name. Don't ruin your reputation. Now that's interesting. Rod, you've made the word, you've used the word several times that demonstration going on. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking of God and Moses. Who was the demonstration for? And I think God was winking at Moses, but he had all the unfallen worlds. <laughs> yes. All the unfallen yeah. worlds that were watching this yes. coming out. And fallen angels. Fallen angels, too. I mean, he was yeah. demonstrating to all of them Moses' transformation. I have never thought of this so clearly as you guys are pulling me to think about it. I really think this is an incredible parallel to Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. Thank you. Okay, so we have, and on Moses' side here, okay, he he um, he's eager for God's good name to be upheld, because he says, you know, what will people say if you just wipe them all out here? They'll say, ah, look at what God did. He seduced them out into the wilderness and. I don't want people to think that about you. That's an incredibly mature thing to be saying, isn't it? Okay, we, we yeah. please, one. He's throwing God's character back at him. Yes. It, you know, in the sense. You're better of, than this, God. 
Well, yeah, you made a promise, and you your word is your word, yes. and okay, you're going. Yeah. And he goes back to you promised this to Abraham, yeah. Isaac, Jacob. And you're going to pull the plug now. Excellent. Okay, one more, and then we're going to go on. So where does this come from? Um, God is threatening to wipe them out. Moses is using arguments that a personal kind of. What's that all about? I, it's a little confusing to me. What's God doing there? Yeah. Does God mess with us? Oh, he does. <laughs> yeah, there's no doubt about that. But you know, um, Moses is basically saying, don't let your ego get in the way. God, don't let your ego get in the way. It does feel that way. I don't know what to do with that comment. <laughs> but I'm glad that we're thinking out loud together. And again, I would go back to Rob's comment. There's clearly a level of friendship here that is pretty deep. We're watching two friends talk. Huh? Talk turkey? Is that a they're talking very frankly with each other. Okay, we are going to, yes. Roy, this is the last, last one. <laughs> I wanted to make an application to you. Yeah. The application is that we as God's children should be asked to take in the great multitude mm. of God's people mm. who are not uh, yeah. knowledgeable, so yeah. much like Israel was doing. And uh, we have to care for them you know, and help them change into the image of God. Yeah. Very good point. This whole idea of caring for others. And it becomes obvious in this story as we move across um, and in the remaining stories that both God and Moses really did care about these people. Really did. And yet we see this very dynamic conversation over 40 years, what well, it means to care for people that are really hard to love. Which, again, well, there's many things we probably can't relate to. How many of us, don't raise your hand, but how many of us have people in our lives that are really hard to love? Okay, so let's let's fill in the rest here. What do you admire about Moses? What do you admire about God? Real briefly, we'll just pull together some of the stuff we've already said. What do you admire about Moses? Um, I think he's seeing that God is love. <clears throat> and he is telling God, don't mess with that. He sees God's love. I saw him clearly back here. Um, that Moses really cared for the people. You know, we see Moses love. He cares. Moses cares. Who are one or two most? What do you probably about Moses? Yeah. His courage. His courage. Dwayne? I was going to say the same thing. Took a lot of audacity to challenge him. No, good. Did I miss another hand? Yeah, he didn't yeah. jump on this. Yeah. yeah. Again, it's the selfless. His no, because he was in that family line. Yeah, he could have still, he still filled the promise. Okay, let's go on to God. What do you admire about God here? What? He was willing to be admonished by a lowly human being. Yeah, he admonished. You know, if I was to again go back to the thing of parenting, of course, I've got all adult children. Now, hang on just a second. And so it's one thing to take advice from, for example, a son and daughter-in-law of a physical therapist. I gladly take free advice from them all the time. But when they were teenagers, mm -hmm. when some of the teenager and then the other, I think it's hard to take things from kids, especially if they're right about something that's important. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we see God modeling some parenting stuff here, I think. Yeah, Becky. This is for, for Moses. I think Moses had a complete trust in God. Yeah. To, to be able to have that conversation. Can yeah. you? Yeah. Trust. Okay, anything else for God that you admire? Gordon. 
It looks to me like God, and I think about other places in the Bible, God not only messes with people in terms of their thinking, mm -hmm. but he seems to be able to present things to them verbally or however that draw out or he's looking for yes. is he messes with us not because he is trying to humiliate us, but because sometimes it's the best way to get our attention. Anything else on God that you admire? I'm sorry. He listens. He listens. And Ron? Listen, and not only listen, he was saying that he heard him. Well, I'll bring it, well one more. I've got her. two children, and they're fighting, and uh, one smacks that one. And so I put them both together, and I'll say, I, I'm sorry this happened, but... Uh, I'm going to take this one out and we're going to just shoot him in the front yard. And the other child goes, no, and it reveals that child's love, really. It's a graphic illustration. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is that not what's going on? Yeah. 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 I love being in this class. I learned so much. <laughs> Last comment. Well, I just want to echo a similar thought to what we've all been saying. out a quality looking for as a quality leader of the yes. people. My thoughts when we talk okay, God's playing big cop, yeah. but if it wasn't for the wrong uh, message that God has said with all this opportunity to step up to be a quality leader looking yeah. for I'm going to make a summary statement here about this one. God is so much more than we ever imagined. We have such tiny and distorted. They're not only distorted, but they're tiny pictures of who God is. We just need to keep expanding our understanding. And I think passages like this challenge us to do that. Sometimes the most challenging passages in Scripture do that the most. Okay. Remaining questions to note on this conversation? You've done it. Would he have done it? That's a good question. Would he have actually done it? Would he have done it? Because in the example of taking a child out and shooting him on the lawn, you would not have done it. <laughs> would God have done it? Yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> okay. okay, would God have done it? Any other questions? On the last one. And this one is, is rich, and it really is kind of the punchline of where we're going to go in these stories. What do you see about the friendship here? I'm like, God doesn't let Moses be. And sometimes we confide in our people. This is what I think. So he forewarns. Yeah. Man. Some of us don't like surprises. Pardon me? Some of us don't like surprises. No. He helps him. Yeah. Yes. Communication. 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 Communication, which most relationships on earth are not always great about. Rob, let me put yours down here. <laughs> Say it again. I don't remember what I said. With the ability to argue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can argue. Okay, we're going to have to go on. Oh, yes, Becky. Dr. Dobson, in a book that I read, Love Must Be Tough, made the comment that you cannot be friends or you cannot have a relationship without mutual respect. No, love it. Mutual respect. But when you say that, just stop and think what you're saying. Not only do I respect God, but... Okay, let's go on to the next story, or the next conversation and story, mutual respect. Uh, I'll tell you, this is much richer than anything I came up on my own. Love the process of working together on something. 
Okay, let's go to the next sentence. Chapter 32. This is a very brief conversation. Chapter 32, verse 31. So what has happened in between these two conversations is that Moses goes down, he breaks the table, he questions Aaron, he finds out what really happened, and um, there's some punishment meted out, and then we come to this conversation in verse 31. <coughs> So Moses went back to the Lord and said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. Made us go out of the gold. Now, please forgive their sins. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. The Lord replied to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot. You read that differently. The Lord replied to Moses, whoever sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go. The people of the place I spoke of, my angel will go before you. However, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sin. Okay. A short conversation. Let's do this one fairly quickly. What's, what's God's message here? What do you see in God's He is expressing justice. What else do you see? I'm not going to put the blame. I'm, I'm not going to hold someone accountable that didn't do it. Yeah. So again, this justice is um, appropriate responsibility. Appropriate <coughs> responsibility. Okay. Good. Somebody else. He's got a, God's got a strategy because instead of punishing them right then and there, he said there's a time and a place for it. So something has to be met. <clears throat> yeah, playing a long game here. He said there's a strategy. We're not done with this. Yep. Is there a possibility that the punishment was you're going to walk around for 40 years in the wilderness? Well, that was part of it. Somebody else, what do you see from God here? Targeted. I'm sorry? He's targeted. Yeah, it is targeted. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go to Moses. What do you see from Moses here? He addresses the people as this people. Now it's not yours or mine. So the um, joint custody? <laughs> <laughs> what else do you see? What specifically? Offering in mountain. Do you think this was window dressing? Or do you think he would have actually followed through on this? I think he would have followed through. I think he was sincere. Yeah, yeah. This situation. Don't trust the bluffer. Yeah. How many times do you hear parents say, if you do that one more time? Yeah, and then if you do that one more time. Yeah. And I'm one of those people that don't care. And so I'm like, if you say it, you follow through yeah. with yeah. it. If you yeah. say it one more time, then yeah. that means one more yeah, time. It means one more time. Or else the kid doesn't think they can trust you. And to just go back to this point here, would God have done it? God did it at the flood. Done that sort of thing. Do it again. And and so they're those raise other questions. Is that is that kind of God? How does that fit in with God's character, et cetera? Which are not trails we're going to go down, but it is a good comment. Yes, please. Well, if he didn't destroy the, the wicked angels in heaven, would he have really destroyed a wicked people? Like, and again, that raises the question like when we study Ananias and Sapphira. Why does judgment sometimes seem to come like this, and other times it's delayed? And I don't know that I know all the answers. I, I think I have some clues. But for me, that's a question I would put here. But let's go back here. Okay, so we see something about both God and Moses. What do you admire? What do you admire about Moses? What do you admire about God here? So you, you see that for Moses, you admire him. Not skip a beat, okay? Yeah, he's, he's right there. And he's probably been thinking about it. Is it possible that my life as a leader 
good stand in for all these people. What else? What do you admire about Moses? Sounds like Christ. Very much like Jesus. Anybody else? For their mistakes. Okay, what do you admire about God? Patience. Yeah, yeah. I would put with the patience this idea of a strategy, appropriate. Well, that was something else, but appropriate times. God says, We're not done with this. We are going to keep working on this. Back and then. Power of Moses' intercession. For the people and how God responded to that intercession, I think is a lesson even for you. Yeah. And I do not understand how intercession works for other people. I just know it does. Yeah. I'm just going to say, um, I think he's very understanding. He understands the plight that yeah. humanity is in, how we're just bombarded to be. Idiots, yep. sinners, yep. to start. Yep, yep. Okay, I think I'll take whatever hand was up, and then we'll go on. Ron, please. Verse thirty-four, and we always third. We always think of the burning bush as Moses called, oh. but here it says, after this whole thing comes down, God says, "Therefore, go lead these people." Oh, wow! And You're really he's already found out this now. He's not going to be his mouth. Oh. So God is calling Moses here very differently. At the burning bush, Moses was saying, anybody but me. But here he's saying, I will stand in for these people as needed. Wow, that's a lot of maturing in a few months. I think I saw Stanley's hand in your hand. I like how he's a good, he's teaching Moses how to be a good leader. Like first he teaches him how to have unconditional love for his people. Yeah. And he's like, well, I'll just take my time and and do this to them, yeah. but now he's teaching him the boundary of can't you have to have them accept responsibility for their actions. Yeah. So there's that delicate balance. You've heard me say this many times before, and I'm going to summarize this: this idea of pulling together grace and accountability. Both are there. He is willing to reset. To to okay, I'm going to wipe them out. There's intercession. Okay, let's reset. Let's start again. Yeah. Any remaining questions? I just have one. Yeah. That God could be persuaded. What is this being persuaded by? We're not going to answer it. But, um, this is the, oh, okay. He's not, he's not surprised. Yeah. Not surprised. Okay, finally, here's the important one. What do we see about friendship here between God and Moses? This is going to be controversial, but that's okay. what I do. We, we like to think of God as omniscient, knowing everything. But experientially, this is a new experience for God, this relationship with Moses. Yep, it is. And I think God was learning from Moses mm. experientially, as well as Moses learning for God. And that's what friends do. Mutual learning. I'm just going to put it there. And I agree with you. That's a big thing for me to wrap my mind around. Thank you. Mutual learning. Anybody else? What have you seen about a friend? I would say mutual negotiation. Mutual negotiation. But that's what friends do. They, yeah. they negotiate the difficult. Excellent. Thanks. Anybody else? Friendship. But dependence. Dependence. Well, Jesus, who are you going to depend on? Well, I got this staff. I got these miracles. My brother. Then he goes through this experience, and now Moses realizes, I can't lead these people unless I'm dependent on you. This is going to be a wow. co-leadership. The other hands, please. Well, as far as the question goes, you mentioned this last week. You don't have those conversations with God. So if, if in here it was... Verses were all God speaking to Moses. I'm not saying it right. But what if Moses didn't hear God speaking in words? Like that bothers me. That's my question. Like, what do we do? And and let me see if I'm if I'm getting the essence of this. This appears to be an audible conversation. Yeah, yes. 
And so that makes it easier to say, here's a back and forth conversation. But what about when that conversation not audible? How do we know this isn't just our head talking to us? Yeah. Is that kind of the, what yeah, you're saying? That's so my question. Yeah. Okay. So not audible. Um, and again, let me refer to my own experience. All, we're doing pretty good on time, by the way. Let me give you a, a, another example. I gave you a couple last week. And I want you to know, caveat, I have a few stories, and for me, they're kind of impactful, and, and as I've shared with others, they seem to be, this is not something that happens to me every week. I don't want to portray it that way. These are two stories spread out over 40, 50 years. I don't know what other people's experiences are like. Maybe some people hear from God in different ways, but I think of times, and, and one story for me is um, Sunday morning, I was heading to the dump didn't have trash service out where we lived in the hills. And so I periodically have to go to the dump and I was dirty. I hadn't showered that morning. Plus I've been handling all this garbage and I'm driving to the dump, coming down a long hill. And <clears throat> just before I get to the bottom of the hill, I hear a very strong voice in my head. that says, turn left now. The dump is that way. And again, strong, clear words in my head, not audible, but turn left now. And okay, and then as I was trying, I said, oh, I know it's down this way. And just less than a mile down that road was a family who had just had a death in the family. I had not met them before, but through mutual acquaintances, I had been referred there, and I showed up literally within 10 minutes of a mother dying at home from cancer. And so I was there at a very raw, real moment. I never met them before, but they, we had this mutual acquaintance. And so I just sat with them, stories and so forth. But it was a very, and I, I had gone because they said, why don't you go visit this family? Well, I got there. And we'd had good connection, but that was the only connection we'd ever had. And I didn't know that it was gonna go any farther. And so, when I got this strong voice in my head, turn left now, I thought, oh, I know who lives down this road. I don't want to go see anybody like this. Not a good time to visit. Well, I'll follow through. I'll at least follow through. And so I, I drove to the, the house. It was just right close there. And I, I, I drove on the property. Everything was completely vacated. It was, um, you know, no cars around. You could see there was no furniture in the house. I mean, it was, it was vacated. And I had this sense of, you no, know, why, why did I come here? I thought you, you had your wires crossed. You know, there was just, this wasn't. And I was getting back in my, in my truck, ready to go. And the widower, the husband and his wife died, pulled into the drive just as I was leaving. And he had come to do something there to get a garden hose out of the yard or something. I forget what he was coming to do. Came, he was just going to be quick and gone. He, he was there intending to come and be there about two minutes. If I had not been there at that exact moment, I would not have seen him. Plus, he had moved to a different town, not too far away, but about 20 minutes away. Had no contact. I, in the days before cell phones, I would have had no way to reach him again. Literally, this was the only time and way I would have had. And I said, oh, what you were doing here didn't you? <laughs> we had a nice conversation. We exchanged phone numbers at that point. Fast forward a year and a half later, he was teaching a Sabbath school class. It had been embraced by that church family. And they were a family who had been bitter and away from the Adventist church for decades. I just think God want to speak to us and he does want to use his speaking to us for the benefit, not of having some interesting story to tell, but the benefit of reaching people, reaching people. And that was clearly a case of drawing this person into a family where they could be. So I don't know the answer to your question because I'm still learning to listen to God's voice. 
I don't know what I would do if I heard God's voice audibly. I think it might really scare me. But I am learning to respond when I hear it clearly in my head. Right. The sermon today by Pastor Diego on this idea because of things that he's gone through. We need to understand that God's protection, which I think is absolute with God and his children, that doesn't mean we don't have crises that happen in our life, yeah. but it's an opportunity. If we are trusting him for a victory in what it is. And it's part of the reason that we come together for Sabbath school, for church, for things like potluck, when we are rubbing shoulders with other people who are also on a faith journey. It's an opportunity for us to just take a little step, maybe a larger step forward in our experience with God. Talking with somebody just this week who has, for health reasons, not been able to attend church in a long time. Said, I know that my spiritual life has suffered. Because attending church, even if it's a bad sermon, even if the music is horrible, connecting with other believers does something. Okay, let's go on to the last one here. So this last one is longer, and there is a little bit of story woven into the conversation. But this is all part of the same golden cap story. So let's come here to um, chapter 33, verse 12. And several things have happened, which you can read about on your own. But now we come to verse 12. And this is kind of the, I won't say the conclusion of the golden cap story, but it's, it's near the conclusion. Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me Lead these people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. You've said, I know you, you by name, and you found favor, um, you found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. Now this this is loaded. This little conversation is loaded. So just kind of hang on to some of these things. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the name, uh, my, my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there's a place near where you may, there's a place near where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back. My face must not be seen. The Lord said to Moses, Chisel out two tables, two stone tables, like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that you that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready in the morning, and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. He passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers of the third, to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshiped. O oh Lord, if I found favor in your eyes, he said, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is the stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. Then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you. 
for all your people. I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. People you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Obey what I command you today, and I will drive out before you the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you are going. They will break, they will be a snare among you. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their asher poles. Do not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. That's a longer conversation, much longer than this one, but it really is kind of the wrapping up. But this is where he comes back up and he gets the um, tablets redone. So it's kind of the bookend on, on this. So, what's God's part of the conversation? A lot there. Look at the text, see what you can summarize. I have a question. Yep. Was that Jesus or the Father? It was Jesus. And the reason I say that is that Paul says that the rock that provided them water and that followed them everywhere they went was Jesus. Now, that opens up new questions. So what's the Father doing? How does Jesus and the Father work together? Where's the Spirit? Lots of other questions, but I'll go with that for now. Thank you. What do you see here from God? God's making quite a few promises. Okay, so let's add that here. God is making promises. Contract. Contract. Is that what you said, Stanley? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what else? That's a one. Yes. This one gets more personal, doesn't it? it does want us to know. Jack, please. Uh, please. So, something that is so interesting here Moses wants to see God. And what God shows to Moses is his character. So, what I like about it is when I want to see God, all I need to know is learn more about who he truly is, his character. And that way I can see a reflection of him. Okay, so. I'm going to go down a very short rabbit trail here. God says, you can't see my face, but it's okay for you to see my back. Okay. And he says, if you really want to see me, and then he lists off character qualities. Jesus says in John chapter 4, God is spirit. God has no body. How do you put all this together? What does it mean to see God? If God is doesn't have a body, how can you look at either his face or his back? I, I, I want to go down this too far because it can get very spooky. <coughs> but what's happening here? So if you do it throughout scripture, if you look at every instance where a person saw God, so is it Moses, Isaac, John, Revelation, Daniel? It's very similar scene, but what I find fascinating was their response. They all fell down before that character yeah. Yeah. and worshipped. Thank you, Boy. First Corinthians 15th chapter talks about God wants to be all in all. <coughs> Back to friendship, I think... God wanted to be friends with Moses and wanted to look at him face to face. Anytime divinity is in the same place with there's this destruction that happens. So he says, okay, for right now, you're going to see my back end. Yeah, and I, I think that that's taking us in the right direction. I'm not going to go down this any farther, but I don't understand how God shows up. God shows up sometimes, like with Abraham, and looks like a human being, or shows up and looks like a burning bush. Or shows up and looks like somebody on the throne, or shows up and looks like I think God can choose to look however God wants to look. And sometimes the way that God looks is more easy to look on than others, but there's this basic idea that God is so different than us that if we were really to see what another that means, to experience God and God's fullness, we would be absolutely overwhelmed to the point of death. I think that's 
obviously something to say yes. Would underestimate the uh, commonality between God and Moses in the fourth encounter. Um, God is actually reveling in the fellowship of a human who's so yes. close to him. So there's a God and went away with a big smile. So. I think so too. And I think that, that God has the capacity. If we have been out of touch with God for a long time, for God to say, I've missed you. Because God wants that connection with us. <laughs> Makes me think of second coming. Mm. When every eye will see him, mm. and of course the wicked are destroyed by mm. this brightness, they can't tolerate. Yet we get to see him. Yeah, Revelation chapter 6 pictures two very different reactions to the face of God. One group of people says, wow, this is our God. And the other people would rather charge into an avalanche and say, there's no way I'm going to face that face. Same face, different reactions. Okay, we are now very, I, I correctly predicted how we're going to be here. We've got five minutes and we've got all of this. Let's just real quickly so this is what you see about God. What do you see about Moses? Some things you've already said. It's okay to just summarize them. Eager to be close to God. Eager to be close to God. We see something here that is more personal. In fact, at this point, there's not as much conversation. There is some, but there's not as much conversation out of the people. It's more about Moses saying, I really want to know you, God. At this point, Moses has learned how to negotiate mm -hmm. with him. I'm going to go with this. Yeah. Okay. So, what do you see here that you admire in both God and Moses? What do you admire? He knows my name. Yes, he knows my name. Oh. He is willing to reveal to as much as we can see. Now, as much as we can mm -hmm. yes. recognizes his yes. really does recognize his name God. <laughs> an answer please he's all in he's very devoted he's like I'm from here from very reluctant to very determined this is so different than the burning bush yeah. questions unanswered questions that he knew his name. I'm just wondering why we never knew his name before he was Moses. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. Okay. Or why God didn't change his name back to. Well, the question I have is I'd love to be a fly on the wall when God finally resurrected Moses. Uh -huh. And then they could look at each other face to face. Yes. Can you imagine yes. that? You're jumping ahead to the end of the month, yeah. but we are going to go there. Okay. So, most important one here, friendship. What do we see here about the friendship? Maturing. Maturing, yes. What else? Something that we know about spiritual friendship is really key. <clears throat> In friendship, there's Deepening, I like you, and the next thing. That's, that is so evident in this experience with God and Moses that this is not static. There's always one more step of growth in between. Hang on just a second, but there's the other. Whose hand did I miss? Um, in spite of their tough conversations. Yeah, in spite of the tough conversations, God gives them courage to go forward. We're going to wrap up with this. He, Moses here has gotten to the point with God. It makes me think of how we might get to the in in the New Jerusalem, yeah. etc., yeah. where you know he's the boss, but but we are important yeah. in the yeah. whole picture. I'm going to use that as the segue to to wrap up here. We're going to wrap up here in just a moment. Different question than sometimes I ask. I hope that some sense of longing, some sense of yearning, some deep desire has been stirred up within you. 
What I'd like you to do is try to identify that and give a word or two to it. And then turn to somebody near you and say, I want to win that sentence. Turn to somebody, I want. you know, there are times when I enjoy working with you on a passage more than others. I've really enjoyed this one today. Thank you. Thank you for your thinking. I encourage you to go back and read the parts we didn't read. It will raise more questions, but it will also probably fill in more blanks. We think we know the story of the Ten Commandments and the Golden Calf. I would guess that for all of us, including me, we had never really paid that much attention to these conversations that punctuate that story. Conversations are rich. They are. Duan, you want to close with something? I, I just want to make sure that everyone, even if you're visiting, are welcome to come to the potluck and that we're meeting in the pavilion. It has us brained. And so it'll be right after second service. Right after second service, pavilion, which is right out this way at the end of the parking lot, come for lunch and just have a chance to meet some people you didn't know or catch up with people you haven't seen for a while or just have a good time with, with each other. And um, Stan, would you be willing to close the prayer for us? Desperately don't want to hear who. Ooh, ooh. So give us the. One last thing that I thought of while standing was praying. I've talked with two or three of you. I've had a chance to have some nice conversations. And I want you to just think about this, and maybe it's something we'll talk about informally at lunch, just kind of around the table. Some of you have said, would it be possible for our class to do some stuff outside of class? And they've talked about two or three times when we've done this over the years. We haven't done it very often. And two different types of activities have come up. One of them is an activity where we just go deeper in something and we... We experience something together, we learn. And I'm going to pick on Keith here. Um, Keith and I were talking about this, but it was volunteering. I was saying, I'd like to volunteer you. Keith has done some amazing research with dinosaurs, with the dig that he goes on every year. How many of you would love to hear about dinosaurs from a creationist perspective? Wouldn't that be interesting to spend an afternoon doing that? And so that was one thing I said, Keith, if we did something like this, we'd give him. So there's a learning part of it. And then there's a service part of it. And somebody else I was talking to said, you know, there are all kinds of people around us. And what came up in this conversation was that there are people like kids in the city who could use very simple trades education. You know, the simplest thing, like how to do repairs, how to do some simple oil changes, that sort of thing. Would we ever think as a class to say, let's take on a project like that. It's kind of maybe a one-time or it might be a repeating project. Give that some thought. I realize that our Sabbath school class has a certain dynamic when we meet together once a week. But what if we were to expand that just a little bit more and maybe a handful of times in a year do some other things? I've just given you two examples. Those probably aren't even the best examples, except the keys. I mean, that's a really good example. <laughs> but if, we, if you wanted to, to think about something that we might do as a class outside of class, either to serve or to learn, give us some thought we might talk about a little bit. Anyway, see you guys. See you at lunch. <laughs> Don't forget to leave your name. <laughs>